Welcome to the Inner Ho Uprising, the podcast about sex, love, and dating from the perspective of me, Sam, one Black, non-monogamish, non-binary-ish feminist hoe who lives in New York City. Every episode of the Inner Ho Uprising works like this. Myself and my lovely rotating co-hosts talk about sex, love, and dating as it pertains to current events in the world, our lives, and yours. And occasionally, we hit you with interview episodes with insightful folks or do deep dive episodes on a topic of our choice. This episode is one of those very insightful interview episodes. So my co ho Akuin and I are talking to a badass group of queer elders of color. We're chatting about sex, love, and dating back in the day and now. Plus, we're getting into the evolutions of the queer community in New York City over the decades. You're not going to want to miss this one. And if you would like to follow along with the conversation had in this podcast on social media, you can use the hashtag Innerho Uprising or tweet at us by using the at Innerho Uprising, no G at the end. And we're also at Innerho Uprising on Instagram. Grandma! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you a hoe? All right, so let's hop right into things. So for this episode, my co-ho Aku and I took a trip over to Brooklyn to visit the members of the Grio Circle. Grio Circle is a community-based, multi-generational organization serving LGBTQ elders of color. Their mission is to respond to and eliminate all forms of oppression, including ageism, racism, sexism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, poverty, xenophobia, and all their intersections. So the word Grio, if you're not familiar, means storyteller in Western Africa, and it's a person who perpetuates the oral tradition and history of their village or family. The acronym GRIO stands for Gay Reunion in Our Time. So the two together symbolize the heart and soul of GRIO Circle. So in that same tradition of storytelling, we sat down with members of the GRIO Circle on a Tuesday afternoon in November during their coffee chat hour. And we had our own sharing circle of sorts. We began with the subject of what was it like growing up gay back in the day. And our homegirl Roz starts us off. I just had a little bit to say when you're talking about age and younger and older. I know as I got older and would go to the village, you know, like by the pier and stuff, and it just amazed me to see how comfortable the young generation are opposed to how we were. We were kind of shut in, but now a lot of them are out there open, happy, free, just enjoying it, not hiding and, and really comfortable with themselves. But we had to, you know, kind of be discreet you know, stuff like that. So that's mainly what I wanted to say. Well, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, let us get your name and how old you are. And I guess talk a little bit about what it looked like being discreet back in the days. Okay, my name is Roz. I'm a Gree Up member for many years and I'm 74. And back in the day, it was a little bit different for our, our age, our generation. I remember even coming out to go to the clubs out at the village, how kind of shut in we were, you know, like you couldn't just come out and be yourself and be open and enjoy and have fun, even though we would stay in Waverly Park, you know, be there a lot of times and really having fun. But I noticed that years later, how more comfortable younger generations are. You know, they're out there, you know, enjoying themselves, but they did have stories like they still couldn't leave the house with certain attire, so they would throw their clothes out the window, you know, and travel with that and change, you know, who they were. And that's basically it. Thank you, Roz. You're welcome. And thanks for being the first person to chat with us. What era did you grow up in? Um, and what did people believe about being gay around that time? That you had a mental problem. So what kinds of people were saying that? Basically heterosexual. Actually, not from my family per se, but friends. You know how hard it was for them to be themselves in their household. Mm -hmm. And like some of them even had to be institutionalized because they thought, that your child really had a problem. You know, especially when they used to use the tar derogatory words, like you lesbian, you butch, you, you know, stuff like that, faggot. So those kind of ways. Uh, hello everybody, my name is uh, Dottie Roberts. I'm 75. I, I wanna, I agree with what the Raz said, but I wanna go over to about the, the military. I was in the military. And if I had, and then when you first went in, they asked you, are you a homosexual? I don't know why they, they asked me that because I, I spent the token to come down there to the recruiting places. If I was going to tell them I was homosexual, that's a wasted token. But I told them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, talk, they asked you a different question. They asked me, was I homosexual? I said, no. But um, that was a big stigma. It still is in the military because if I went in there and they found out that I was uh, gay, I would have got like maybe an administrative discharge, not an honorable 
and, and released and everything. And you can't have a so-called best friends in there that may be straight and, and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm gay. They would report you, you know, because of jealousy or whatever to the commander. So it was very, you had to keep that really quiet that you, that you get. Plus, you, a lot of them women in you don't want to deal with them anyway. You know, I mean, the people, they think, they think because you're a woman, another woman's going to really be interested in you. But you have your choices just like everybody else has choices. Plus, back in the day, they thought we were super clean. We were always taking showers. Because what about when you go in the showers? You know, what, what happened? So what happened you go in the showers? They thought stuff was going to be jumping off in the showers. But as years went on, they, they said, well, don't ask, don't tell. And if, but you still, you can still have to be cautious about um, your lifestyle there. Okay, you can't trust anybody until you get out of there because you don't want to get out of there with a, a, a other than a, a honorable discharge. You lose a lot of stuff. But uh, and then I like I was also raised in foster homes as a teenager. You dare not say anything about you liking, you know, women because uh, um, there are heterosexual people there. So you keep that quiet. All this is secret. You know. You know. You. You. you so. But I even, like, a long time ago, I, I met a woman. She was straight, and she called this man. Uh, he was, and she liked him a whole, the, the family liked him a whole lot. And she said, you know that faggot that works on the job? I said, what are you talking about, faggot? Well, you, know, you know the faggot that, I said, don't ever use that word around me. Because to me, when you call some, you know, the, that use that word, it's like you're using the N-word with us. Okay. I said, don't use that with me because she probably <laughs> called me names when I wasn't around. Behind your back, yeah. But they liked him. He was nice, but he was the he was the faggot. Okay, okay. That's all I wanted to say. I'm sure other people had something to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you like we sure. always do in church. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. You can just pass that mic over. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Chancer, and I'm 72 years old. Well, I can start with I didn't. I was gay from the time I was 11, but I didn't know what it was. I officially came out when I was 40, and that was in 1990. Um, and I, I was in the village. I, I, I was surrounded by gay people and, and, or, or straight people who didn't really care uh, what we were into. And a lot of uh, love, 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 love. So for me, it was um, a breeze uh, being a lesbian at that time, uh, the same applied itself to my family, um, who I can say for sure loved me, loved me enough to hear what I said when I came out to them and said that I'm a lesbian, but also to just, um, uh, uh accept that part of it and then make the rest of it invisible. Okay, and that was fine with me. Uh, I very rarely heard any derogatory um, statements towards me being a lesbian from the general public. And it usually came out in the form of, because sometimes I would be very butchy. I go into a store or something, and you can tell the difference between when someone actually makes a mistake and says, sir, Okay, or when they're deliberately, you know, like, well, who do you think you are? Things like that I would come up against here and there. But in general, um, uh, for me and the people who were around me, and I was part of Sage then, part of Identity House then, it was, it seemed to be real breezy compared to what the, the, the stuff that's coming at us today. And, and and in later years. Can you talk a little bit about what Sage and Identity House are? Okay, so Identity House is, and I believe they're still around, uh, they're the same thing that s s both of them, Sage USA and Identity House, like Griot Circle, are all agencies that advocate for uh, the gay LGBTQ uh, community. Griot starting in 1996, but of course, Sage and Identity House were in place when I came in on the scene in 1990. Um, played a major, major, Identity House and Sage 
mostly identity house played a major role in that time that I came out and 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 helping me take bringing me into an arena where there were people like me so that I can make friends, um, find a mate. I also worked for Identity House as a peer counselor. They trained me as a peer counselor. And um, in general, they they serviced the, the, the gay lesbian community, whether you were senior or, or young. And Identity House was staffed mostly with therapists and psychiatrists. Uh, except for members like myself, who they train up, uh, or otherwise, uh, Sage was a community sent uh, a community place because they had only a room at that time in the the Thirteenth Street LGBTQ Center, and so that that was another place that we could just go and, and communicate with each other and say, "Yo, what's up?" And then you had all the other, you know, the bar, uh, crazy nannies, the Duchess. Okay, um, fat cats. These were all bars and things that that Bonnie and Clyde. You know, we had the the warehouse dances. I don't know if y'all ever remember on twelfth on twelfth Avenue. And they'd have the warehouse dances and the funny, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and the interesting thing is that there were three different kinds. And I'm only talking about women. There were three different kinds of dances. So there were the Latino lesbian dances. There were the black lesbian dances. And there were the white lesbian dances. Okay. And um, I, I usually got around <laughs> <laughs> to all of them. And, and, and it was just so nice to be in, in a, a, a crowded room of women. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I didn't get, like I said before, I didn't get a lot of political hack from from people. But those were the glory days, I tell you. <laughs> I tell you. Yeah. Like yeah. the first time walking into the Duchess, you know, when I realized, you know, coming back in 1990 and my cousin taking me to the Duchess, I said, oh, I'm home. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm, you know, the candy store, women that? hugging each other and talking to each other lovingly. Yeah, yeah. I love being a lesbian. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very happy that yeah, I'm happy to hear that you didn't get so much political hack. And you know, this podcast is not only talking about like the sad things that happen to us. Like, we're definitely here to talk about like the joy and the heyday and y'all going out. So, like, does anybody else want to paint a picture of like what a typical night was like, like going out on or the a scene? typical weekend? Yeah, to some of these. Yeah, if the holiday. Uh, hello, hello. This, this is Daddy again. If the holiday was on a Monday. The clothes would be packed on Sunday night. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, I mean, and then you hang out, you know, after after the clothes. But that was a fun time. Anytime it was a holiday and everything. And, and, and those nights, especially at Bonnie Clyde, you didn't have to pay to come in on that Sunday night. Mm. So that was fun times. Yeah. Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, you know what else? There were the, 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 the camp outs, you know, the women mm. gatherings, like the Michigan gathering, mm. the Echo Lake and... I believe Echo Lake is in Pennsylvania, okay, where you'd have hundreds of women who would converge for a weekend or a week to camp out. Ooh, my, my, my. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Always, also, so re speech was yes. very popular, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. They would have parties and, and, and gatherings, and you could, you know, dress. Uh, whatever you way you wanted there, mm -hmm. so that was a very popular place to go in summertime. Yeah, still is. Oh, now I wasn't talking about clothing at these campsites. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. Except, of course, you know, if I was with someone, you need to go put some clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> My eyes only. <laughs> Anybody else want to talk about the um? The heyday, the going outings. Yeah, this is Rod's coming back at you. <laughs> yeah, just talking about the heydays and like leaving the clubs, like Dottie said, on Sunday, you know, so many people were out. But after the clubs closed, 
we would hang out at the Washington Square Park. And I mean, the benches used to face each other in rows. People sat on that side in rows, and people on the other side. And we would be there literally all night. Then there was a restaurant on West 4th Street that we would all go to have breakfast at. And I mean, it was just so nice and so peaceful and it was, it was all about us, you know? And then another thing, when Chancellor talked about the club, I never realized there were so many gay women and it was like a pleasure to be there. It's like, wow, this is where I need to be. You know, glad that I found that place, you know. I am Adrian. Hi, Adrian. I am 67, so I am younger. And um, my experience was very, very different. Oh, tell us about it. Um, my father was brought up with his um, first cousin who was gay. His aunt uh, remarried. And her second husband um, was very abusive to the cousin. And so my grandmother said, you know, why don't you just have Sonny come and, and live with us? So my, as I said, my father grew up with his first cousin who was gay. And um, that was just part of our family, including Sonny's long-term partner, Willie, who would come over to our, our house. You know, you, you know I, I remember Willie pushing us in the swing and wee, wee. He, he was, um, he had a very definite sort of a feminine air to him. Uh -huh. but, you know, but, you know, he was, as, as I said, he was, he was part of the family. Um, I don't think I really came out until probably I was in college, but uh, it was not, a big deal at all. You, you know, I, I went to a women's college, went to Smith College, Northampton, center of the lesbian universe. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, you know, it was no big deal. Um, moved to New York, never really hung out in the village, never, you know, never, never did any of that. Um, worked for a while here in the city. Uh, my partner then was part of like you know a creative lesbian circle that included like sapphire and um i think sherlane oh, yeah. you know sure sherlane was there i, I remember sherlane i think sherlane mccray yeah sherlane mccray yeah. graduate you know, graduated wellesley maybe a year before i did you know just you know all hang out then i went to law school um Met my partner there. We were together for 35 years. Wow. Raised, raised, raised two children. Um, we're founding members of Center Kids, which was an organization from the, the 13th Street Center to, to support gay and lesbian families, which were new at, at that time. Um, so I, I, I guess mine would just be, you know, a regular sort of, you know, mundane, unexciting. <laughs> a boring gay. You, said you, you, know, so, you weren't so, a party gay. No, I'm hearing. No, 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 no. no not, not at all. You know, <laughs> soccer mom. I you know, worked part time from the time my, up until my oldest was, let, let me see, if my oldest was 17, um, you know, being, you know, gay or lesbian was not an issue in my office, my workplace. I mean, um, I, I was, I just retired in June. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I was supervising attorney at the Legal Aid Society Criminal Appeals Bureau. We, and well, come people, through black lawyer. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> and, and, and for a very long time, I was the only woman and the only person of color supervising attorney work product. Mm. And, 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 and what, is, what, what, yeah. what is considered the brain trust of the organization. You, you can actually put in my name. And you said you could Google me. You can Google my case. You know? yeah. We love that. We love, love that. it. Um, you know, raised two daughters, you know, soccer, yeah. so soccer mom, mm -hmm. you know, b tutoring, you know, work, worked as a, um, Volunteer college counselor, boys and girls high school, you know, active in my church. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but we're we're shades of people, you know. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that because like the diversity. I know, but but, yeah. but 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 my shade is beige. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, gotcha. it's, 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 you know, oh, you know, taupe or gray, gotcha. so, 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 something neutral. That's important too. That's important too. Yeah. Me and Akua are pretty boring people. Yes, <laughs> actually. <laughs> oh. I'm Larry, and I'm 82. Hi, Larry. Hey, Larry. Um, yeah. If I was going to describe the air uh, that I would be Eisenhower and McCarthy. Mm. Because if the history books make it to where Eisenhower won World War II, mm-hmm. um, but when he became president, one of the first things he did was in identifying gays that they should be fired and gotten out of the government. And then Senator McCarthy picks up on this to where uh, there were all sorts of investigations going on to to. Gays were considered criminals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we went from mental health, having a mental health issue, to just being well, straight well, at the a same criminal. Time, the mental inter- industry uh, mm-hmm. had us as being crazy. Gotcha. But then we were also be considered criminals. Criminals. Mm-hmm. And it got to the point that the, we were considered criminals without prosecution in terms that if we went to a place where there were other homosexuals, there was a law that criminals cannot congregate with criminals. Mm-hmm. And just being in a gay bar, you can be arrested. It was a crime. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew a lot of people got, that lost their careers. Mm-hmm. So I never pursued a college career, a college degree or a career because it could be lost just as a matter of being in a gay bar. Mm-hmm. I knew you was going through that. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew it. Well, the mic is already in your hand, so <laughs> if you'd like to. Oh, all right. I, I, I was deciding whether I want to say something. but Peer pressure. I guess from my accent, you all know I'm from Jamaica, or uh, from the Caribbean, right? Well... When we was growing up, we didn't know nothing about gay and, and um, lesbian and all those things. If it was there, if it was there, we didn't know about it. But when I came to America in 1969, I was only 16. By the way, I'm an identical twin. Unfortunately, my sister, she's still alive, but she had a stroke, and she's, we have to take care of her. And... She started going to this church. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Reverend Zach. It's not, okay. Well, it's gay church. Mm. I didn't know what it was then. But every Sunday, my sister would be gone. (laughs) You know? So I was the one who was married and had children. So, of course, I had a husband. I couldn't go on. You know, you, you don't talk about those things. It's like a taboo. But anyway... After I got divorced, I started, my sister said, you know, you need to start coming to church with me. And we grew up as Roman Catholic. So I would only go to what I know, but she would be at this church. So I said, all right, I'll come with you one Sunday. And I go to the church and I see women all in women, men all in men. And, you know, I always had this funny feeling inside, but I couldn't explain it. Then when I see women on the TV, it would just like turn me on. I would say, damn, these women is pretty and they got nice bodies and things. And then one day I'm watching the TV and my husband said to me, say, so what are you, a lesbian? So I said, what is a lesbian? Because I didn't know what he was talking about. And then I started to figure it out on my own and I went to my sister and she says, listen, it's just like a man loving a woman. Only thing you love a woman instead of. But I never, I never, um, where you would say like get on it or acknowledge it. I just know there was something about me that I love seeing women, beautiful women, and I didn't do nothing about it. But then after I got divorced and you know was miserable and things was going on, Mrs. I started to go to church with my sister. And, you know, just like seeing that you could be in a space where people can be who them is, say who them is, 
and nobody call your name because a Caribbean people is funny. You can lose your whole family once them find out so you're sleeping with a woman because it's all about God. You know, but God God don't um prosecute you and him don't say who oh, you are, him is the one who will make you with me it with. So if we turn out to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, whatever it is, then him don't know before we even was born what we were supposed to be. So, you know, I'll wait until him come and take my punishment. But <laughs> you know, I don't care about what other people want to say. Yeah. Amen. Did, Amen. 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 <laughs> did you, um, did your ever, did your sister ever tell you she was gay? Or did no, you find out I when just, you went to the church? I just, no. I didn't even, I don't even think she know what it was. I just went to her house one day and, and see she and this woman kissing. And right away I said, you're going to go to hell. That's abomination to the Lord. And I just started to say, that's not right. That's why God made men so you could be with men. And as it go on and go on and I say, oh, happy she was and comfortably in who she is. I just stopped, did it. And then I said, damn, twins... When them say identical twins, they really, meant, they really they meant, meant identical. You know? okay. And then when she saw me with somebody, she said, oh, so you're not going to hell. It's only me. One. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a joke for a long time. <laughs> it was a joke for a long time. But, you know, you, you, you can't help. You can't help how you feel about people. I didn't intentionally to do it, did, you know, wanted to fall in love with a woman or anything. But I guess I would say God had different plans or I had different plans. So I'm living my, living my life the way I want to live it. And I don't have no regret. My children, they're my kind of, I mean, they know so I was with somebody. But I don't push it up in them face. We don't talk about it. And it's like a normal relationship with me and them. All we talk about is we, the family, and what's going on. Who's going to college, who's not going to college. But we don't discuss my life, and I don't bring them around. You know, well, I'm not seeing anybody now, but I don't bring the. I mean, when it's time for them to come over and visit me, it's our time. And when it's time, whenever I find somebody, then it will be a different time. But, you know, I don't shove it up in them face like some parents and say, oh, this, because that's not my growing up um, thing. And even now, a lot of my friends, them, Jamaican friends, they'll talk about it. And I hear all them talk about all uh, oh, these gay women and the faggots and the things like that. And it hurt. Because only if I could tell them that the same names them calling them, that I'm part of that. But I love my friends them. And if that's not their lifestyle, I don't want to push it on them. And But if them did ask, I would say, yeah, I'm seeing somebody. You know, then it would be up to them because friendship is, I know these people from I was like five years old. Some know and them accept it. And the ears do as well, still have them, them ass up in the ear. And you don't know what you're doing. So I don't, I don't care what people do as long as you respect me and don't call me name. If you're going to call me name, then before it used to be faggot. It's not faggot anymore. Or you, you say, oh, she's a gay woman. Or she just like another woman. That, and I've always kept that. I don't call people name out of, because I wouldn't want nobody call me that. So I just leave it like that. Right. Thank you for sharing. I feel like such an outsider, like an outlier for, with, 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 with all of your stories. My my children are exactly the opposite. And maybe because they're a different age and, and again, a different time. Um, my partner of 35 years, but we, we separated about eight years ago, sold the house, you know, she's living out in Brooklyn. I'm still, you know, we, you, you know, we still decide, you know, where we're going to go for Thanksgiving, that my children, the young attorneys, everybody wants to try and fix me up. If you, 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 you want them out of your business. They are all, they're all up in your business, in my business, you know, and, and one of them, you know, she, she says, she says, let me do, I'll do your okay Cupid profile. I do it really well. You know, you know, I've, I've met lots of women that way. It's, it's like, you know, 
No. <laughs> so l- let's actually turn to that for a little bit. What is it like dating as an older adult? Is anybody out there on the scene? Okay. Not me. No. Okay. no. <laughs> can, can I say something before you guys go? Yeah. Well, you, you know what's so funny? I have four children, two boys and two girls. And the youngest one, the youngest boy, him said, mommy, go out and live your life. And the excuse the expression, him said, fuck everybody and go <laughs> do what you need to do and make yourself happy. Don't worry about we, because we, uh, we have who we want and we grew up. But, you know, I'm always worried about me being by myself and when am I going to get somebody? And I said, listen, don't worry about me. I'm okay. When it come, it come. And if it don't come, I can deal with it. Like but that. there's always one with a soft heart. Two of my children are like me, very soft, cry easily. And the other two, <laughs> you could knock them with a stone, forget it. It ain't breaking. I relate to that. I'm the soft heart child. <laughs> so we're talking about dating as an older person. Yep. So over the years, I have pretty much slowed down. Um, though I, I, I would like to be with someone. The couple of times in the last two years that I met someone and 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 dated, it's not for me it's not any different from when I was in my younger days, except um I'm slower. I I, I tend not to uh jump in bed right away. I tend to like to to I'm very comfortable at, at like getting to know somebody and uh Like recently, I had, um, over a few months ago, I had been seeing somebody for a couple of months. And then, you know, I realized this wasn't where I wanted to go. And and the reason I could say that comfortably is because it was over a period of four, four months. And we had gotten to know each other, blah, blah, and... But the experience is different on the level that I am, and and, and I could say uh, with with the last person also that she also was very comfortable at at a slower pace. It wasn't the the there was a sexual desire there, um, but there was more of. Um, Let's be friends, okay? And not speaking it, but it's just comfortable just knowing each other. And as a matter of fact, we didn't, we talked about it um, like in the, uh, in the middle after knowing each other, maybe six or seven weeks, we actually talked about the fact that where we're going and how comfortable it is to move in this direction. Something that at 30 years old, hell, I would have been in bed and we would have been moved in with each other. And, <laughs> 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 you know, man or woman, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. Um, and and I, 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 I truly appreciate that difference because it's, it turns out to be safer and, and better at choosing where I want to go. And as uh, something that Adrian said, well, my children, okay, it's not, you know, you sometimes, especially kids will, you need to tell them something. In particular, one of them didn't know that I was gay. And um, I had to, he was trying to set me up, you know, with guys. And I was like, (laughs) <laughs> Sorry to tell you, baby. <laughs> well, you know, the the interesting thing is that he had questioned me about my the way I was dressing. <laughs> you know, because I'm butch. Okay. Right. And um I was avoiding telling him because of what had happened with my first one, but it went right over his head and he he just so I had to tell him. But um I just wanted to interject that, but Going back to dating, I really enjoy dating during this period of of time because I am more mature. I am more aware of 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 where I'm where I want to be and and what I'm looking for. Okay. And I'm not fanatic. You know, 
some when I was younger, there were times if I was coming out of a relationship, I was like, I got to find somebody else mm-hmm. before this is, you know what I'm saying? But now it's like, I'm, I'm cool with me. Mm-hmm. All right. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, I regret that too. And I'm also, I'm also not, I'm not also not into any more having communicable, a, a, what is it? Commuting sex, I, you know, like j- just to know somebody on a sexual level. That's not satisfying for me anymore either. All right, we hope you're enjoying this episode with the folks from the Grio Circle as much as we are. We're having so much fun. Uh, I'm just popping in to share some very important news about our podcast. So as many of you may know by now, what you're listening to right now is the second to last episode of the Inner Hall Uprising podcast. That's right. After this week, there will be one more episode of IHU ever of all time. That's it. And as we come to an end, I just want to say I'm utterly grateful to all of you listeners for taking this journey with us. I'm so glad to have been part of the show onto all of you and to have constantly been filled up by your love and engagement with this podcast. In that same spirit, we love, love, love for you to be a part of our final episode. We are begging for you to be a part of our final episode. That's why we're asking you all to share your special memories or moments of IHU with us via voicemail. To share your thoughts, you can leave a voicemail to 404-491-9158, and that number will be in the show notes. But again, it's 404-491-9158. If you love this show or love what we've done for the past 10 seasons, now's your chance to show us how you really feel. One last time. Thanks for rocking with us. Back to the show. Yeah, back on that note, what Chance is saying, this is Rods again speaking. Um, As far as dating, um, at a certain age, you always want somebody to be there. Mine is more of a companion type thing, you know. And if the sex, I like sex as well, but that's not my main objective. It's just having you know, like a, pa- a companion, somebody likes to do the things that you do, the company, um, even the cuddling, you know, just things like that. But as far as it has to be sexual, it, it, with me, it doesn't have to be like that, you know. It doesn't have to be a sexual thing, even though I like sex too. But I'm more into like um, companionship, doing a lot of things together that you like, even just laying and watching a movie together, you know, cuddling, just that company. Yeah. <laughs> Roz is like hitting on company. chance apparently <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> inside scoop in the grill circle <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, that, basically that's what it is I guess as you get older I'm sure there's like a lot of people well I'm not even sure I don't know what other people do behind closed doors and what they're looking for but I know as a senior I really like that company more so able to go and do things together and like I said, there's always going to be a time of intimacy, you know, and stuff like that. But if not, just being there, being able to be comfortable with somebody, being able to watch a movie, laying in the bed together, you know, and cuddling, stuff like that. Okay. I'm not talking to you, Chancer. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason why, my name is Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Jerry Whitsitt Pilgrim. One of the reasons why I'm talking because of Lisa. I um, I'm 78, anticipating my 88. Um, I was with my partner for 52 years. I didn't even know I was gay. My mother told me I was gay. Because my friends, we were living together, and I was always said, my best friend. My mother said, I'm tired of your best friend. Uh, You're living with your best friend? Well, what are y'all doing? I couldn't tell my mother what we were doing. (laughs) (laughs) However, uh, she said, describe her to me. I described her to my mother, and she said, oh, she's a butch. I didn't even know, I didn't even realize that my mother knew that term. I came from a very religious family, so I'm saying like, my mama know what a butch is. (laughs) (laughs) However, uh, 
after she told me, she said, you know, the two of y'all are gay. And I confess. And she said to me, uh, don't tell your daddy. And I was trying to figure out why not tell my daddy. She said, no, I will tell him. She said, because it's a delicate subject, and I have to introduce him to that, which I did. Well, uh, we were the first in Brooklyn to get married as a gay couple when it came. We had, had stated we wanted to go to Canada, but that wasn't working. Uh, she worked as a social worker, and I was working as a teacher. Um, my daughter, I have a daughter, who at the time when, I think that's when I really fell in love with her, cause she said, my daughter was with my mom, and she said, I want you to go send for our daughter. She used to call her every week. Every week she would make a phone call, and she would ask my daughter, what you want? What, what, what's grandma doing for you? What did grandma didn't give you? And um, my daughter would explain to her. So when she became uh, five, um, she said to me, I want you to send and get our daughter. She didn't say your daughter. She said, our daughter. and that was like, it made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. yeah. She said, I want us to be a family. Um, when she started school, um, she wanted to make sure that she was home to take her on her first day to school. She enrolled her in PS3, which is called the Bell. Village school at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, my daughter embraced her, loved her. A couple of the neighborhood kids asked, How's your, well, that parents probably had been talking mm -hmm. and said, um, How's your Aunt Barbara, your Aunt Barbara? Mm -hmm. She said, Because she's my mother's sister. <laughs> so in the meantime, um, my partner died four years ago. I'm so sorry. Um, I miss her so much. But in the meantime, I'm having a book published from the time we met until the end, you know, until she passed away. Mm -hmm. 52 years. That's 52 beautiful. 52 years. wonderful years. What kept your marriage um, going so strong? Well, in my book, you will see. I'm, I'm, <laughs> She said, you got to pay for that. <laughs> you got to read the book. Serious. I wrote a recipe. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote a recipe that made us stay together. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. Is good as the recipe for that cake? Better. <laughs> Better. Does, it uh, Does it include sex? No, not really. Oh and, the, it, you know, read the book. You know. <laughs> She's like, I'm not giving away these secrets. Uh, hopefully, the, the first of the year. All right. We can't wait to read it. Here, I hope. Pardon me? I hope you're going to have an event here. Oh, yeah. 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 We'll be there. Yeah. We're going to be there. <laughs> right. Well, so, I, I think oh, people. You have something to say? Oh, no. I think uh, okay. You sure? Because <laughs> <I guess. laughs> last time I was here, you I'm had sorry. some interesting things to say. Hi, my name is Doretha. And hey, Doretha. I'm a proud thankful member of Griot. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a relationship. I'm 78 years old. Um, I've been looking, trying, you know, here and there. But it just don't happen. Mm -hmm. And when it does, it's going to be a grateful one because I like long-term relationships. I don't like to be in flip-flop. And I have when I was younger a little bit. But someone mentioned mental health before. Mm -hmm. I held it in so long when I found out what it was, because I didn't know what it was, my feelings when I was a child. I really didn't know what it was. And uh, after I found out for sure what I was feeling, what I was thinking, I went into a depression because I was absolutely embarrassed at myself. I looked down on myself. I just couldn't handle it. I got married. I had two kids. Unfortunately, my son died when he was almost two. I'm sorry. But I went through all that. I loved my husband. 
but I, I wanted to be gay, but I just couldn't let it out. So I went through all of that depression for nothing. But when I did come out, I started feeling good about myself. I started loving myself. And then I was in a relationship. You know, I fooled around a little bit in between. I don't want nobody to think I'm a goody goody because I'm not. I f fooled around. A and when I did come, you know, when I did settle down, which it only took me less than a year to really quiet down, maybe six months. I met somebody and I was with that person 29 and almost a half years. Wow. And we broke up suddenly. And I just haven't had feelings for nobody. But somebody had come along. And then when I did have feeling with somebody, for somebody, it didn't last. You know, maybe a week, mm -hmm. two weeks. And then I didn't even meet. I thought about you. No, it's not happening. But I'm happy now that I'm here. And this is the first time that in my life, since I've been coming to Grill, that I felt included. Because all my friends and things that I had before and the parties I went to, I never felt I belong. And this is the first time in my life I felt like I belong. That's why my mouth is big, because <laughs> I never used to talk. I never grin. My girlfriend told me one time, she said, I smiled at something. She said, as long as I've been knowing you, I've never seen you smile. I didn't have nothing to smile about. Now you can't keep my mouth closed. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. But, you know, I think this is the best place. And also that if we see young children like my great-granddaughter um, coming our way, you know, and trying to express her personality, I think they need help of being a coming out and being who they are without people shaming them and put enough spirit into their soul and body to let them know if anybody starts trying to shame them do the short um short version of the center of the serenity prayer mm. and you know what that is <laughs> <laughs> and i'm good mm -hmm. i'm good thank that's you beautiful. that's it in the introduction of my book i i say to people or whoever reads it, about young people. I lived near us, um, two blocks away from a school, junior high. They are out there. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Um, one of the reasons, I think, besides loving my partner, that I wrote the book to uh, introduce some things that we see young people do, um, that's a way to do anything. Um, and I wanted them to know, just be comfortable. Even at your age, some of those young people are 13, 14, hugging and kissing um, out. And, you know, older people don't really understand that. Hoping that they will understand some of the things that they are doing is, uh, as an older person, I feel that it's wrong, but it might not be wrong for them. But they will know the difference. Between what feels comfortable and what doesn't. Um, getting naked in the street. I'm going to say that, you know, they're pulling off their clothes, not really stock naked, but they're, um, there's a way that you do that. And there's a way when I... Like I said, I didn't even know I was gay until my parents told me that I was gay. Um, and I, after my parents told me, I found out my, my partner taught me how to play Pokino. I love Pokino, okay? Um, Bid whiz. Because I was a workaholic. All I did was work, 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 try to save a few pennies. And it's not all about that. You st I still wasn't happy. Um, so I just, that's one of the reasons why I wrote that recipe. Um, 
Griot has changed my life. My partner brought me to Griot. She was a longtime member. Um, if it had to been for Griot, I don't think I'd be writing this book. We had a teacher who taught us how to write uh, and At be Griot creative. Circle. Right here at Griot. Um, and I'm thankful for that. Otherwise, I have a college education, but it don't mean, I can't say it don't mean nothing. Just because you have a college education don't mean that you know everything. And, uh, you know, people need to know that. You can be a college ed educated person and still be stupid. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I've witnessed. So, right. so I, I enjoy my life. Final question for all of you, for the room, whoever wants to take it. Um, one thing that we want to do with our show is kind of like bridge this gap, right? So if there's any words of wisdom that you'd like to share with younger queer people, what would that be? Yeah, Roz? That you could be anything you want to be as long as you're respectful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to say any woman that does not have a woman as her best friend is a lonely woman. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yes. That sounds good, Dottie. But I have a lot of friends. Every woman in here is my friend. And since I start coming to Creole, I'm just in love with everybody because I have a lot of friends. But my word of wisdom, try to be yourself. I didn't come out until I, after I was 40. And a whole new world opened up for me. I think I look old, younger now than I did when I was 40 because I was always frowning. I had nothing to laugh about. I had nothing to be happy about. So be who you are. And anybody else that don't like it, don't approve of it, just dismiss them. That's mm -hmm. all. Good words of wisdom. It's Adrian. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've noticed with a number of my daughter's friends who are lesbian is some of them th who have had difficult lives are very hard, very brittle, not as, you know, compassionate as I know they could be. So one of the things I would say is, you know, whatever your hardships are, try, try to make sure that they don't end up, you know, hardening your heart and making it more difficult for people to, you know, get in touch with you. Great words of wisdom share my wisdom. One of the things I realize, now I'm living for myself. I've been taking care of everybody, sisters, children, everybody run to me. But one of the things I find out is that nobody ever think about me. So when I moved like two months ago, I said, Lord, I'm going to devote myself to me. I'm going to change my ways. I can't be looking out for everybody, doing for everybody. And I don't have any fun of doing things where I want. And then I realize a lot of time I call people and ask them if they want to do something. They say yes. But then it never get done. So that's another promise I make to myself. You know what? The person I'm born with can't help me no more because she can't do anything. So screw everybody and go do what you have to do and enjoy life. Because tomorrow is not promised to anybody. I love that. Anyone. Okay, my name is Barbara, and um, I heard a, a quick piece of wisdom right here. But um, if it's what I have learned in life, being around women and just life within itself has really been beautiful for me. Every day I feel is a lesson learned, no matter if it's just a little bit or a big bit. Um, I heard what Annette just said, and it's very true. I think we get to a certain place in life where we figure we want to help everybody and then when you look around one day there's no one to help you but I also feel do what your heart tell you to do just because there's no one to reach to pull you farther up be an example um, I heard a little bit of what Doritha said when she came out whatever she did she feel much better today it's great from probably who she's around the changes in her life. Um, I just was a blessed person that each day of my life has been a beautiful one. So now I don't know if I came in on the right part of the subject to say anything other than that, 
But most of all, it's a pleasure being here with all of you. Okay. It's a pleasure. Oh, and I'm 69. Gosh, I'm probably 73. This is Daddy again. I just want to say, when if you if you know that you're gay and you and you really are into the same sex that you are, and you have to be in a relationship with a man or whatever, it's like you're in a prison without bars. You know, like and 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 a lot of women for years and years they live in that prison, you know? And like life is short, you know, like you're here today and gone today. And if you can, you try to get out of that prison. Okay? That's all I want to say. Amen. It's been really inspiring hearing all of your stories. Um, I don't think that seeing queer elders is norm, you know. We don't get to see queer people live as long as you have, you know, um, get into a space or get into an age that, you know, I aspire to be. So it's really it's awesome to see all of you guys here <laughs> like, it's really awesome to see all of you guys here and hear your stories and your pieces of wisdom um and you really highlighted something that i've learned throughout the years that no one's story is the same there's not one gay story there's not one coming out story there's not one story where not a monolith where shades of people have different experiences um along the same common thread um so thank you but i'm even interested in how a younger generation is doing now in today's world and what it looks like to you? Uh, I think it looks a lot more open than y'all's generation. So like when I was coming up specifically, it was it was like both normal, but also like a joke to be queer. Like we went to the same middle school and like I knew that I was attracted to like all genders when I was very young, but I was just like, okay, that's interesting. And I kind of just like shut it off. But I had like a bunch of gay friends in middle school and things like that. But they would also make fun of like the lesbian girls would make fun of gay guys and the gay guys would make fun of lesbian girls. So it was like it was accepted, but it wasn't. So you think your time was better than. No. Time? What do you yeah. mean? I, I don't think it's compared. I don't. I don't. I don't. When I say I still have problem, I mean, I don't. I can't pick out people mm -hmm. and do an even have a conversation with them because of how the conversation starts. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a simple conversation and people want to know. So, what do you think about gay people? I'm from the year them say it like that, you know, keeping out short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Opening it... up. So, I'm, I'm just wondering if your time was because them saying our time is so much better because we don't have to hide anything anymore, but that's a lie. In the Caribbean, no, yeah, people still get killed. Mm -hmm. Even my brother, I speak to my brother, mm -hmm. and I have never told him that I'm gay because when he talk about oh women, them find women in in um bullshit and things, yeah, and then say guys will shove all stick up inside of them and break it because them say oh so you know what you don't want dick you want um pussy so here is a, a dick so it's still. It's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I 100%, I 100% agree with that. And like my family is Caribbean as well. So like there's definitely some places where I'm not going to be open about my identity. I'm yeah. talking about specifically growing up in like middle class queens. And also, you know, I, to token what Sam was saying, I think that, you know, like how it was kind of normal, but also a joke. I think that there was more words. There was more language to identify quick, more quickly you know, who you liked or, and so forth, but it was still dangerous. Like I am, I am queer. I, I guess I like all, I don't know. I like, it's queer. um, it's, um, it's not everything or all of it. It's kind of a way to walk through life is that you're not straight in sense. So if I put myself, if I gave myself an identity, I am pansexual, but right now I'm engaged to a trans man. Um, I came out when I was 20 something into liking women, but even though I'm engaged, my mother doesn't know any of this. <laughs> um, so there's conversations of like, oh, well, you guys have kids. And I'm like, mm, <laughs> not as easily as you think <laughs> we're going to have kids. But what I was going to say before you talked about queer and what, you know, what did you say? I was feeling like it was more comfortable. I noticed like even with my nieces and nephews, they're so accepting. You know, and they're younger than you guys probably, you know. But, but um, younger people today seem to be so more 
outgoing about the situation, I guess because the peers and so many people around them, and they just seem so free, and then they have us to let them know how comfortable it is, don't you know? It's well, yes, you know, generations today can only be so comfortable because of the of lives that. you have lived. Right, exactly. You know, we we wouldn't be as comfortable. We couldn't be as comfortable if each of you didn't live the life that you lived. Um, so, you know, you've paved the way for us to be more comfortable. And this generation will pave the way for the next one to be even more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that we're not still facing the same hardships. It's, you know, people are still kicked out of their homes, right. homeless, you know, poor health care, poor access to things that they need because of who they love or, you know, who they want to have sex with. Um, and those are the things that we're still fighting for. And that's why it's important for us as the seniors to express, to help you get that, you know, that platform to be able to speak and feel comfortable about who you are. I um, know where it came from. But mostly, I see a lot of people like downtrodden, and I can pick the gay person out. <laughs> and I, I, I go like I'm a rescuer, you know, and start a conversation, and all of a sudden they lighten up and they say, oh, where you live? And I said, well, I live so-and-so, so-and-so, but the people don't know I'm gay. And I tell them, I said, I'm gay. That's you why I picked you out. <laughs> and, they, and, and they like that, mm -hmm. you know. All right, we got to take two more. And then I, I got to go to work. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not I got to go to work. <laughs> this is Dottie again. I feel so good when I see the gay pride parade. How, how big and all those people there and everything. I love that. I love that, that we have gotten to that point that we have all these people here. It seems so strong, you know. So I just, you know, glad about that. Amen. Amen. My, uh, my name is Sandy. My pronouns are she. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you Share your pronouns. Yes, like I said, I've been in the uh, life for about all my life. And I've seen so many changes since I came up because I can remember going to uh, bars that were in the back. I mean, they were hidden. And they had the straight people up front and you go in the back, hidden away. And sometimes I used to just sit in my car scared to go in. But things have really changed now, and I'm so, so grateful for that. And I hope that things will continue to change in a positive way with the uh, politicians kind of somewhat against us and some of them for us. Get out and vote. <laughs> Today's election day that we're recording this. So. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for putting us on the spot. <laughs> <laughs>